This is my X-Blaze plot summary part two. If you haven't watched the first video yet, I would highly recommend you do so, so you at least know what is going on here, because there's no point diving into this video without knowing how, you know, things led up to this point. So, yeah, please watch the first video and then come back here. I will put it in the link, uh, link it in the com pinned comment below, so please watch it. So, without further ado, let's get into this X-Blaze plot summary already. The long sleeve thug went on a rampage, with July commenting that the thug has reached phase 5, which means that the corruption of his soul is nearly complete and is therefore of no use to them. Introducing Ripper, who actually showed up earlier in the game and I completely forgot to mention him, he drops in and rips the crystal out of the thug. Dry is shocked, asking Ripper how many crystals he has consumed thus far, though Dry comes to an understanding without Ripper saying a word. All Dry tells Ripper to do is to quote unquote release the grimoire, telling him that Toya Kagari knows how to do it. Ripper calls out the white haired man who was also there with them, his name being revealed as Zex. Kuon informs Toya about the ten sages who serve as guardians of Ishana. Three of the ten sages, two of them being Dorai and Oct, betrayed the guild and committed a crime. Another one, a white-haired man named Zex, is also with them. Toya immediately remembers Zex from the other night and theorizes that Zex may be a union since Toya heard a discover call when they locked eyes. Kuon suggests that they take on each of the three rebelling sages one at a time, and she goes over their abilities. Dorai can use his powerful physical strength as well as magic, Ark can use ice magic, and Zex can use gravity magic. Toya wonders why the three would even be after him, with Kuon guessing that they're after something known as a grimoire, or in this case, the original grimoire which has been said can bring the power of an evil god, and a chosen one will rise up, bring the azure, and save the world. Kuon berates Toya for willingly putting himself at risk for no reason, but then he brings up the Watasumi incident. Toya reveals that as a child, he was found at ground zero of the facility, and says that his mother, whose name is Ryoko Kagari, but in Endgame her name is Suzuko Kagari, Sorry for breaking this part up, but no, this isn't some kind of name change for plot reasons deal. The localization got the name wrong. Her name is Ryoko, not Suzuko. Sorry for that, but anyway, back to what I was saying. Ryoko Kagari was supposedly a part of the facility, though Toya admits that he could only remember bits and pieces and other stuff that people told him later on in his life. Toya tells Kuon that he keeps having a dream, where it is pitch black and an alarm sound that eventually fades away. He would then see a doll-like girl with blue eyes right in front of him, and when he sees her, he then realizes that his name is Toya Kagari. When Toya doesn't go into much detail, all he hears is a voice that says to quote-unquote protect, and then he finally wakes up. Kuon sympathizes with Toya, but she says that it still doesn't answer why he's helping the Mitsurugi agency. Toya says that the dream he keeps having must have something to do with the Union outbreaks, with the experiments involving his mother, who was in charge of the project. Toya tells that he wanted to help the agency as his mother was responsible, and thus makes him somewhat responsible as well. S tries to scan for any info on the Watatsumi incident, but only says that all information on the research has been deleted. Kuon decides to help out Toya, and Toya promises to tell Kuon if he remembers anything more about his past. After work, Toya and S have a run-in with Mei, who decides to head past the police, who are in a union-related incident, with Mei doing her own investigating on the side. The three reach a crime scene where a gang member named Akio Osafune was stabbed to death in the head, as well as the stomach before being brutally slashed. Mei says that the Mitsurugi agency has gathered that Akio had a crystal within him, which meant that he was a union. Looking at the dead body closer, Toya had realized that Akio Osafune was in fact the long sleeve thug that had attacked them earlier. While Toya initially believed that the Ten Sages killed Akio, Mei says that it isn't the case as another corpse was found in the restricted ward in the same state. The corpse was also that of a union, their crystal being ripped out and them being stabbed to death as well. 
The Mitsurugi Agency gave a code name to the killer, naming him Ripper in reference to his killings. May says that Ripper was a union that had surfaced 13 years prior, and he is known as an irregular type, as his drivability existed before the Watsumi incident even began, which is extremely rare. Ripper was a killing machine even before Watatsumi, and he has been going around killing unions for their crystals, going on to absorbing their power by consuming the crystals. It is said that if a union swallows the crystal of either union, they would change faces so fast that they would die from the strain, but Ripper has been killing and eating crystals for more than a decade now. The more crystals he consumes, the stronger his drive abilities get, which meant that he was constantly getting more and more powerful, and considering that he was already insane, the corruption of a crystal hasn't affected him. According to the TOI, Ripper's drive is named Scissor Hands, and he can also smell other unions, which is how he's tracking them down. Toya hears a Discover call, and Ripper has arrived to attack the three. Mei summons a Shikigami Raven to immobilize Ripper, but he easily cuts it. Ripper latches onto Toya and wonders where the Grimoire is on him, not getting far as S attacks him. S chases down Ripper until a man in a black robe jumps in between the two, a man named Avenged. Toya and Mei arrive to the scene, with Toya trying to stop Avenge and Ripper from fighting. Ripper simply says that he's bored of Toya and then bails. Mei hears of Avenge's name and says that he is a bounty hunter that targets only unions. Toya defends Mei, but he is easily brushed aside by Avenge, though Mei claims that Toya deserved getting hit. Avenge simply warns the three to stay away from him, and then he takes his leave. According to the toy, Avenge is affiliated with the magic guild Ishana, though he lacks the ability to use magic himself. Instead, he uses weapons enchanted with a spell that allows him to strike an opponent and prevent their wounds from being healed with magic. Toya awakes from being knocked unconscious by Avenge, and S carries him home. S apologizes for being unable to protect Toya because his actions make it hard for her to do so. Toya apologizes and says that he doesn't like seeing others get hurt, or worse, being killed, which is why he acts so recklessly. S says that if he keeps acting the way he does, Toya's own life will be in danger, but Toya claims that he can't stand around and do nothing. After Toya and S return home, Kuon learns about Ripper and tells Toya of what she found out today. She tells Toya that something known as a code embryo was something that the Takamagahara were trying to create at the Watatsumi Research Facility, and that there is a major connection between the embryo and the Grimoire, though that was the limit of Kuon's findings. She however believes that there is a chance that both the embryo and the Grimoire are one and the same. Kuon says that Toya's mother, Ryoko Kagari, having the grimoire in her possession could be why that everyone is after him instead. And on top of that, he was a survivor of the Watatsubi incident. Meanwhile, Surichiro has learned about the grimoire and the embryo's connection, ordering someone to watch over Toya as he plots his scheme. A flashback reveals Kuon studying on a chance to join the Ten Sages. She is called in to learn that someone had killed her father and that that same someone stole something known as the Kusanagi from Ishana and then fled with it. Kuon was then given the mission to track down the one who stole the Kusanagi and was even given permission to use the Sealed Spear Izayoi, a legacy weapon, and if she carries the mission out successfully, she will immediately become one of the new Ten Sages. Kuon decides to take the mission, but rejects the offer of becoming one of the new Ten Sages, claiming it to be a mockery of what it means to become one if she earns it in this fashion. Kuon wants to earn the title on her own and be respected by those who earn the titles on their own. Toya, Hinata, and S head to go shopping, where S encounters Pudding for the very first time. Akira, Toya, S, Yuki, Kuon, and Hinata all have a big dinner together, with S immediately falling in love with her pudding after she tastes it, being happy for the first time in her life, and she even equates pudding to happiness as she is still not used to things like that. The gang also hits up the local pool, with even Soichiro showing up and ordering S to have fun. The pool is also funded by the Mitsurugi Agency, because of course it is. 
And you guys know me. Every time fan service comes up, I always have to roll the slideshow. After the fun in the poolside sun, the gang leaves and Mei and Kuon finally meet up. Kuon politely introduces herself, though Mei bites back at her, telling her that members of the Amano Hokusaka clan have no desire to mingle with those in the Magic Guild. Kuon says that she hasn't done anything wrong to Mei, but Mei only says that Kuon being a part of the Magic Guild is enough reason. At night, Zex is encountered by a drunk man. Zex touches the drunk and he burns alive, with Zex saying that the man wasn't an inadequate vessel. Back at the Himezuru slash Kagari household, S tells Toya that another death has happened and that the victim had a crystal removed from his body. Though Toya figures that it could be Ripper, S says that there is no evidence as the death doesn't follow Ripper's usual MO, but it follows a string of other quote unquote unusual deaths. S explains that all the other victims were unions who had crystals, a discovery that May had made. S claims that the victims were killed during a Gain Art episode, which is when a crystal becomes unstable and continues to absorb Seether during the use of a union's drive. Toya asks what Seether even is, and S explains that a union uses their crystal to absorb an airborne particle known as Seether, which can trigger their drive. S has the ability to analyze the Seether absorption levels to determine a union's current phase. She further says that Kuon and Mei can use Seether to use techniques, while a union can use Seether on pure instinct. When one absorbs too much Seether, they'll collapse, but if you're a union, you outright die. The gain art triggered by a union's drive cannot naturally occur on its own, which meant that the victim's drive was forcibly manifested by someone else. If the forcible activation of a dry succeeds, then they are classified as a union, but if not, a gain art episode occurs, and then immediate death. Kuon arrives and claims that Dry is behind the incidents, with Toya believing that they're doing all of this to get closer to the grimoire slash embryo. The three decide to do some investigation in various wards around Shin Yokozaki. Kuon goes over why magic shouldn't be known by outsiders and how she has the sealed spirit Ezioi in her possession. The Ezioi can nullify the magical abilities of a target, and once their powers are sealed, the mage becomes a regular human. S speaks up and says that her sword, the Murakumo, is classified as a legacy weapon, just like the Ezioi. S further explains that the legacy weapons are OO parts, relics from an ancient society that cannot be replicated by modern tech. S explains that the crystal of a union cannot be shattered, but her Murakumo could easily break it. Kuon says that Dry and everyone else with him stole the Kusanagi, a legacy weapon which the Magic Guild had, though it is unknown what the Kusanagi could actually do. S speaks to Toya privately, telling him that the Ezioi has a high risk in using it, that while it can easily steal a mage's power away, it has a very powerful backlash to it, though S says that she has no idea what the risk even is. And stop! <laughs> yeah, that was pretty abrupt, wasn't it? Well, that's because from this point onwards, X-Blade splits off into various routes. It splits off into the Kuon route, the Mei route, the Hinata route, the S route, and finally, after all that, the true ending of the game. So, yeah, this is the split-off point from X-Blaze until it gets into, you know, different territory from here on out. So, without further ado, I will see you all next time for the next... Hopefully, I gotta ch pick and choose a route that splits off the next time. So, yeah, see you all next time.